Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this press conference, and also a warm welcome to our audience on the live stream. Um, um, this is the last press conference on the first day of the World Economic Forum on the Middle East and North Africa. And um, the title of the press conference, uh, I'm sure you're all aware because you're here, is the new vision for Arab employment. And if you follow the program today, you've seen that employment, unemployment have already been uh, very strong on the agenda today. And uh, I'm very pleased uh, that we have this press conference because I'm joined by a very distinct panel uh, of experts from the private sector and also uh, from the World Economic Forum to talk about the issue. And without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, our, our panel um, to you. Um, I'll start to my immediate left. Uh, this is my colleague Sadia Sahidi. She's a senior director at the World Economic Forum, and she's also heading uh, the World Economic Forum, Forum's work on gender, but also, and that is more important for us here today, on human capital. Um, uh, further down the line, we're joined uh, by Mr. Omar Alganim. He's the CEO of Alganim Industries uh, from Kuwait joining us today. Thank you for being here. Um, next to him is Majid Jafar. He is the CEO of Crescent Petroleum from the United Arab Emirates. And last but uh, by no means least, Omar Al Mahdi, who is the managing director and member of the board of Abdul Latif Jamil Industrial Development Company, uh, joining us from Saudi Arabia here today. Um, and um, I'll keep my role to a minimum and hand over to you, uh, Sadia. Um, just one sentence uh, for you to have the context. The World Economic Forum launched last week one of its uh, flagship reports, the Human Capital Report. And in this report, um, we, uh, we showed that despite significant investment, um, the, the labor market and the skill sets here, especially here in the region in the Middle East, are not uh, what, the, what the labor market needs. But in more detail, Sadia, um, please, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me give just a little bit of context to what the forum is doing in this space. Um, the forum has committed significant time and energy um, for some time to come to uh, 10 global challenges um, that we're going to make a long-term effort around. One of those is the topic of employment skills and human capital. And there we're trying to do two sets of things. One is analysis that uh, gives us a sense of where we are today, where we might be headed in the future, and what can be done about it. And the second set of things is applications of that analysis it, through regional projects as well as industry projects. And one of those regional projects is what you will hear about later today, the new vision for Arab employment. Um, on the analysis, um, the Human Capital Index um, is a tool for understanding how uh, countries are developing and deploying their human capital. Um, you won't be surprised to uh, learn that, uh, given the, the issues uh, in the region, that only two countries actually make it into the top half of the rankings of 124 countries. That's the UAE and Qatar at 54 and 56. Um, Jordan and Egypt at 76 and 84 actually do better than very high-income countries like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait that are at 85 and 93. And then we've got um, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Mauritania, all, all really much further down. Uh, between 95 and 124, so the last ranking country is, is also from the region. Um, what the index tells us overall, and it's, it's trying to divide up various sections of the demography of each of these countries um, by age group. So in the under 15 group, um, there are obviously a lot of investments being made, but the major issue is quality, what is actually being taught. In the 15 to 24 year age group, that's where you start seeing some real divergence happening. That's where even in the countries with the biggest rates of people going to uh, university, so for example, 57% tertiary enrollment right now in Saudi Arabia, that still means about 40% of your young people are not going to university. This is still much, much lower than, uh, more, um, than, than Europe or, or the United States, for example. Um, and so much work still to be done just simply to make sure that people are making it into university. And then what is being taught in universities, clearly there is a major mismatch between what is happening in terms of giving people um, high skills, tertiary skills, and then what's happening inside labor markets because very quickly you start seeing, even for those that are highly educated, very uh, high rates of youth unemployment. What that leads to for the region um, is very high unemployment, obviously. Um, a, a, a skills mismatch when it comes to the workplace, and then many people that are actually not active at all. So again, to give the example of Saudi Arabia, 
um, out of the 40% uh, or so that are not active at all, about 16% hold university degrees. So most of these people are women. But basically, you, even where there is talent that has been invested in, they're not actually choosing to be active in the labor force. So those three sets of issues are actually happening around the world. Um, the rising unemployment, the changing nature of the workplace, and the growing skills mismatch. Um, in particular, for this region, that leads to this paradox where, on the one hand, Yes, people are not finding the jobs that they need, but on the other hand, business leaders are saying they're not finding the talent that they need. Um, and a little bit more on that before I hand it over, um, what does the future of jobs look like in the MENA region? So another study that we're conducting, and I'll tell you just a little bit about the preliminary results of that, um, what we find from the heads of strategy and the heads of HR that have been um, responding to our, to our surveys from this region in particular, um, Technology will obviously cause some of the biggest disruptions to business models, but the overall outlook for employment is incredibly positive. Almost 70% of the people that we interviewed um, said that they expect technology to create more jobs rather than disrupt jobs, but that comes with a very specific set of conditions, only if people are skilled in order to be able to take those jobs. Otherwise, not only will businesses not grow, but unemployment will be higher. Let me give you a very quick example from three industries. Healthcare industry, what's going to be uh, some of the professions that they're going to need much more of? It's not doctors, it's data analysts. In the case of the financial services industry, it's not brokers, it's not bank tellers, it's IT security analysts. And in the case of the consumer and retail industry, it's not assembly workers, it's not factory workers, um, it's actually people who can manage complexity. It's basically managers, collaborators, people who are going to make those more automated systems work together. So given that particular shift, um, we will only see worsening rates of unemployment and a more difficult situation for businesses to be able to find the kind of talent they need unless we make some very specific investments in training and skilling. Thank you, Sadia. Um, thank you for the uh, analysis. Clearly, that is a challenge uh, for, for all industries, and not only in this region, but um, Omar Alganim, you're a CEO, you have a company to run. Is uh, the situation of human capital keeping you up at night? And uh, what, can, what can you, what can the private sector do to uh, help alleviate that situation? Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> and, and Saida, thank you for, for covering the, the, the situation so, so thoroughly. Um, so I, I've assumed chairmanship of the, the Regional Business Council um, for, for the last year. And the Regional Business Council has done a tremendous amount of work beforehand, doing diagnostic work and really understanding what the problem is with youth unemployment and trying to understand and diagnose what the problem is. And a tremendous amount of work. And you can tell from what Saida was saying here and really understanding that problem well. Um, but in the last year, what we've really tried to do is try to harness the bandwidth of the organizations that are within the Regional Business Council to affect change to the youth now. So what can the organizations that are part of the Regional Business Council do to really take the lives of young people, affect that, and change it now? So we came up with a commitment that the companies would make, which is to affect 100,000 100, youth by the time we get to Davos. Uh, uh, later on, uh, uh, early next year. And we're already 55% of the way there. And, and uh, inshallah, we will beat the goal and, and beat the 100,000 mark. And, and that's, you know, we, we look at, at the problems and we spend a lot of time here looking at problems. But I think what we also need to do is create momentum and create momentum towards fixing problems. And, and that's the power of, of the Regional Business Council and the companies that are in there. And, and by the way, that's only. 10 out of the 30 companies that have responded so far. So I, I still think we're going to really beat the 100,000 and get a much better response. And once you create momentum, and once you start affecting young people's lives, you, you start affecting the way people sh think and shape the way people think, the way governments think about young people, and see that you can reskill these people. You can have them get engaged into the private sector. You can have them look at life differently. And when that happens, and when you create that m positive momentum, that's how you can start changing societies and start changing the future of the way of the society that we live in. And after all, where we do business is the neighborhood that we're in. And so it's our responsibility as a private sector to do this. Um, so it's um, something that I'm very excited about. And I'm very excited about all the support of all the groups uh, that are sitting here. And, and it's really their support that's made this possible. 
uh, and uh, it's it's a, it's a tremendous effort, and I think a real call to action from from the forum, and uh, it's uh, it's exciting. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what, what my company is doing, uh, Algonim Industries. We've committed to uh, take on 4,000 youth, <coughs> part, part of them through Injaz, which is a, a youth entrepreneurship program, where we send two two volunteers into schools and help these young people start up their own companies, their own ideas. And that culminates in a country uh, competition and then a regional competition. And then the other part is helping people get their MBAs. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was a very powerful call for action indeed. Um, Mr. Jafar, obviously you have joined that effort already, so you don't need convincing. But uh, share with us why, why did you think this is a, why did you join this initiative? Uh, what's your perspective? Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, as uh, Amar described, the Regional Business Council has as members the members, the corporate members from the Middle East, North Africa region, and the World Economic uh, Forum. Uh, the number one risk identified for our region by the the Forum's Global Risk Survey um, is youth unemployment. Uh, aside from the analytical and, and policy work and the issues which get discussed at the summit uh, today and tomorrow and, and other summits, including the annual uh, meeting in Davos, um, there was the uh, desire, uh, as Amar expressed it, for us to be doing something bottom-up to really be affecting uh, young people now. And it's, it's critical uh, for our issue. My own uh, industry, the oil and gas industry, it makes up a very large part of the economy in the region, uh, but actually a very small part of the workforce. And that's even smaller today than it was 30 years ago. You don't need, you know, 30 years ago, you might have needed 50 people to run a, an oil installation. Now you can do it with five people and, and some software. Um, so the, the, the impact of technology, as was mentioned, it can, can be an opportunity, but it can also be um, a, a threat. So reskilling or, or upskilling um, the workforce, uh, developing employment skills, not just the, the education skills which are provided for by the Ministry of Education uh, curricula, but really what the private sector needs uh, is critical. And it's, it's an area where the members of the community of the uh, council, the Regional Business Council, can really add value because they know uh, the skills that they need in the marketplace. Um, so I think it, it can very much uh, complement. So in, in the three key areas that the different initiatives looked at and tried to tackle one or two uh, or even all three is developing employment skills, uh, fostering uh, entrepreneurship and connecting talent uh, to markets. Um, and uh, some of the companies uh, will do the projects in-house, and uh, many will partner with organizations. Uh, Amar mentioned uh, Njaz. Uh, we, as uh, Crescent Petroleum and Crescent Enterprises, two companies in our group, combined commitment to 8,500 uh, young people. And we have different partnerships as well, including um, Idraq, Queen Rania Foundation here in Jordan, Mosaic, which is a uh, uh, UK charity for um, pr providing uh, opportunities, and they have an international program which is currently going on for uh, young people from across the region. It's actually going on these three weeks in Jordan this year, but it moves around. So the private sector companies partnering with nonprofit entities and, and global uh, uh, institutions is very much part of the, uh, the approach. Thank you very much. Um, Omar Al-Mahdi, um, share, share your perspective uh, uh, with us um, why this is an important initiative and, and especially what is the Saudi Arabian perspective uh, here. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm here represented, representing my colleagues in uh, ALG Community Initiatives, which was founded back in 2003 as our platform for giving back to society and to our communities. Uh, from the earliest days of founding ALJ Community Initiatives, or ALJCI, uh, we've been attempting to be pioneers uh, and in active and positive social change and contributions 
within our local community in Saudi Arabia, but across the border of Saudi as well. Um, and we give back through five main platforms or pillars which we've identified, one of them being the job creation pillar through Babrisk Jamil, the arts and culture pillar through Art Jamil, global poverty alleviation through multiple uh, partnerships, uh, education and training, or what we call education Jamil, last but not least, uh, social Jamil, which is health and social. Um, we firmly believe in the need to both create employment, uh, to place people, young people, in jobs, and also to finance SMEs and, and the youth's ability to enter into the job market. Uh, and along those lines, uh, since 2003, we've uh, trained more than 30,000 people. We've uh, done that through cooperations with technical and vocational institutes, uh, which we've either established or partnered in establishing including the Saudi Japanese uh, High Institute for Automotive, uh, the Electronics Institute, the Nafisa Shams Academy for Arts and Crafts, and the Saudi Health Institute. Uh, on job placement, we've placed more than 140,000 uh, people in Saudi Arabia and across the, the region, 41% of whom are uh, women. Uh, the types of jobs we've placed in are uh, in customer service, sales, management, uh, IT, retail, automotive, and engineering jobs. Um, and in 2003, we established also the financing arm uh, to support in self-employment. We provide interest-free loans uh, up to $100,000. We've supported more than 30,000 entrepreneurs using that. And we've also entered into micro-finance and micro-loans for females, especially who would like to work from home, so enabling uh, at-home employment for females. And uh, more than 200,000 200, females have benefited from that. Uh, so all in all, in the past 10 years or since 2003, we've participated and helped in the creation of more than 590,000 jobs. Um, and we, we firmly believe in this cause. We're firmly committed to continue growing uh, with the years and in partnership with them. Thank you very much. Um, we will have the opportunity for a couple of questions. But before I open the floor, um, we asked our audience on Facebook and Twitter before um, for, for questions. And actually, uh, a lot of young people from the region asked uh, a very, very pragmatic, very straightforward question. And they said, so we have these, these three uh, uh, business leaders on the panel. They, they clearly must know how their industries are developing. So in a nutshell, the question was, what should I study? What should I learn to find a job with your with your uh, with your companies? And Saadi, I mentioned before healthcare, uh, banking, consumer, retail. How the how the skill sets that are needed are changing. Maybe uh, you have like a sentence or two for us. What would you recommend to the young people in the region? What what should they take up? I know there there's no one answer, but uh, maybe you can give us some insights there. Thank you. Well, you know, I think. <coughs> The skills that that are that are missing so far as an education side is is getting access to uh, to schools that can really teach people the critical thinking that's required within business. And but but that you're asking the question from the perspective of a young person, and so that that's what makes it difficult. Do they do they have access to that type of school? And so I think it's it, for for me it's less about the subject matter, and it's more about learning how to think and, and the, the, the process of thinking. And that's what I look for with the people that, that I try to employ. Um, if, you, if you go to Silicon Valley and you go to other areas that are very innovative, it's less about the degrees that they have and more about the way that they think and that the way they look at problems. And, and that's, the, that's typically what I, what I try to look for. So it's, I'm less concerned whether somebody's an engineer or, or, a, uh, or, or a, a marketeer, but it's really how they think. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would say um, uh, first and foremost, uh, English skills. Um, as much as we want to protect our heritage and our language, and we must, but for global employability, uh, and even if that's local, it's a globalized uh, uh, economy, uh, skills in English are very important. Um, I would say technical skills. You don't have to go and study computer science. That's a great one if you can. Um, but uh, certainly having the, those skills are, are uh, important. Uh, obviously, sciences and engineering and, and uh, technical degrees are always in demand, and, and, and going forward, that will continue to be uh, the case. And the other piece of advice I would give 
is um, try and get some work experience while you're studying. Uh, everybody complains in this region, everyone goes and gets a good degree and then they can't get a job without experience. Everyone says, you know, you, you have to get experience. Well, how, do you, how do I get experience when you don't give me <laughs> my first job? So actually, um, what is not so common in our region, which I think needs to be, is uh, you know having doing uh, summer jobs and doing uh, holiday jobs and apprenticeships and, and work placements, even if they're unpaid, uh, even if they're not organized by your university or your <coughs> school, go and find them. Go and find the company that you want to spend time at, and badger them and and offer to uh, to do some holiday work with them because I think that's a very attractive thing to uh, potential employers. Thank you. Uh, Definitely building on, on what uh, both Omar and, uh, and Majid said, I, th I think critical thinking is extremely important. Um, and then the, the degree is also not the most critical factor, as Majid says. It's, um, to me, an important part that's missing in, in a lot of the youth is their ability to sell themselves to employers as well. How do they prepare their resume? How do they act and interact? Uh, uh, how do they build their resume also in terms of community engagement, summer jobs, as you mentioned. Um, so that's a very critical skill that uh, a lot of the youth don't really pay a lot of attention to. Uh, so ultimately, how do you present yourself? How do you sell yourself? Uh, I think are, are very complementary to the, the important points mentioned by my colleagues. Thank you very much. And uh, because the, the gentlemen on the panel have been almost shy about the announcement today, let me repeat this. Uh, until Davos um, uh, next year, which happens in January, as you know, um, the pledge is to, to train and skill 100,000 young people in the region. And the good news, uh, uh, much more than a silver lining, actually, is that we've reached a large part of that. Sadia, uh, I don't want to say the wrong number here. 55%. 55%. So more than half. I think that's very encouraging. Um, and without further ado, we open the floor. We have a microphone in the back. If you could state your name and uh, your organization for the sake of our online, online audience, please. Any questions? I think you've all been so impressed by the, by the question that came in through Twitter. Um, that uh, all, all the answers have been delivered already. Well, thank you very much then. Um, thank you for joining us today.